friends, uh, in this Dhamma talk, I want to talk about uh, a sutra given uh, in the suttas on the, it's called the Relay of Chariots, uh, and it uh, explains how the practice of meditation various stages of meditation serve as a stepping stone for uh, the next uh, uh, stage of the meditation. Uh, similar to uh, the relay of chariots, but in a more contemporary term of in the American West, the Pony Express, right? Mm -hmm. So you all know that a, a person gets a horse and he rides a you know, a certain mileage and the horse gets tired, he stops, he changes horses and then he gets on another one and he keeps on going to, you know, a number of different uh, relay stations until finally he gets to the end. So this uh, discourse uh, kind of explains uh, these uh, certain uh, seven and eight stages in the process of purification. And it takes place between two great monks, not the Buddha actually, but a conversation between uh, Sariputta, the Buddha's chief disciple, and another lesser known uh, monk, but nevertheless he was an arhant also, named uh, Puna Mantaniputta. And it seems that uh, Neither of these monks really knew each other, had ever met each other before, but they knew of each other through talks. So, uh, Puna Mantani Putta, that means the son of a woman named Mantani, uh, knew about the great Sariputta, of course, being the general of the Dhamma. And uh, Sariputta had never uh, heard about uh, this other monk. But uh, one day Sariputta was with all the other monks and he, he asked the other monks, who amongst the monks here is known to be a very good preacher of the Dhamma and very, uh, you know, good uh, monk and so on. And then these other monks said, well, there's this Puna Mantaniputta, you know, he, he came here a short time ago and he's revered and respected and, you know, for his knowledge of the Dhamma. And, so Sariputta thought, ah, I'd like to meet him. Again, you know, he never saw him before, so he didn't know what he looked like. He said, oh, if I get a chance, I'd like to maybe have some conversation with him. So uh, one day, uh, it, uh, some of the monks came to Sariputta and said, you remember that monk, uh, that, that monk we, we, we mentioned, Puna? Well, he's, he's here, you know, and he's, uh, he's going on his alms round now. And so I put it said, oh, wow, that's a good chance. Let me go and I'm following him. And maybe I can have a talk with him after the meal. So, uh, so I put the kind of, you know, uh, saw him going and stayed back some distance. And then after they had both collected their arms and, and had a little rest, uh, Sari so Putta went to the, to the uh, monk and uh, sat down and uh, asked him some questions. Then he asked, Sariputta asked this monk, does the Venerable uh, practice the Dhamma under the Buddha? And, uh, Venerable Puna said, yes. So Sariputta questions him further. Well, does, does one follow the teachings of the Buddha for the sake of a purity of virtue. That means the people practice the Dhamma just to purify their uh, uh, karmic actions. It means purification of sila. 
And he said, not this venerable ascetic. We don't practice just for the purpose of uh, purifying sila. And he said, well, does, do, do you practice for the, the sake of purification of mind? And he said, not this venerable ascetic. Uh, purification of mind means being able to weaken the five hindrances and uh, to attain, uh, you know, access concentration or even uh, some of the jhanas. So he said, no, not this venerable son. And he said, well, does the venerable one practice under the Buddha for purification of view? And Buddha responds, not this venerable son. And purification of view basically means the beginning of insight meditation, understanding the five aggregates in the, the whole body-mind process is just the process of nama rupa, or the process of mentality and materiality. The mind cognizing the material uh, formations, the material vibrations of sight, sound, smells, taste, touches, uh, and so on, and consciousness cognizing them. That's the whole process of body and mind, especially the mind is just this process of uh, mind cognizing objects and passing away without any self or I that's doing that. So that's called purification of view. Uh, and uh, Puna responds again, uh, not this venerable sir. So the you know, Saiput is getting a little bit perplexed. So he keeps on asking him further questions. Well, does the venerable one practice the Dhamma under the Buddha for purity of overcoming uh, doubts? And again, Puna said, no venerable sir. So I put a scratch in the head. He said, well, does uh, the Venerable One practiced the Dhamma under the Buddha for, uh, <clears throat> you know, purification of knowledge of what is the path and what isn't the path. And again, Puna says, no, not this Venerable Son. So anyway, just to, to go back a moment, pur uh, purification of doubt means even though one has purified the view and understood that uh, you know, everything is just mind and matter. Uh, still, some doubts about uh, the self could arise. And some other, you know, doubts concerning, uh, uh, you know, the ultimate goal and so on. Uh, and so th this requires, purity of view means understanding the five aggregates in their anicca dukkaranatta aspects. Uh, purity of overcoming doubts refers to understanding the paticca samuppada, or the 12 links of dependent origination in their forward and reverse uh, order. Now, this may seem similar complex uh, if you don't know what it is, but it's just an extensive kind of uh, uh, analysis of the five aggregates in terms of the conditional arising that, you know, overcomes any remaining or lingering doubts uh, that may still have been there, especially the doubts about the self and about uh, no self, because that's what the Paticca Samuppada is concerned with. So again, Venerable Puna tells Sariputta, no, we don't, uh, we're not practicing just for uh, you know, the purity of uh, overcoming doubts or what is the path and what isn't the path. And this refers to uh, the getting attracted to the uh, byproducts of meditation. That means when you reach deep levels of concentration and uh, insight, you could see like uh, you know, internal light. You can see, you know, a, a, you know, an inner light arise in the mind, or you could see other kind of phenomena, mental images, and or extreme bliss, 
or you could even get some psychic power. If you attain certain levels of jhana, you could maybe get the ability to read somebody's mind or, uh, you know, even uh, perhaps uh, levitate or something. And people get attached to that. And they're thinking, ah, now I, I'm, I mean, I'm getting close to enlightenment. Or they might even take that to be enlightenment. And that is not enlightenment. These are just the you know, byproducts of, of meditation, especially of concentration meditation. So uh, understanding what is the, the true path to liberation as opposed to just the, uh, the trinkets or the, uh, you know, the interesting byproducts of developing concentration and insight, as, as I imagine, as, and getting uh, attached to them. Like just wanting to stay absorbed in the infinite light or something that's in the mind or infinite bliss and people just want to groove and hang out or, or with some vision that they might be seeing in the mind. But that's like a dead-end street, you know, and it can retard one's meditation and not really, you know, get onto the real path. So it's like coming to a fork in the road and people taking these uh, byproducts of concentration for really being the path instead of the path of insight. So that is what is called the purification of what is the overcoming, the, the, what is the, the path and not, not the path. And of course that comes through uh, understanding that you know liberation uh, comes through the path of insight and not through the path of just concentration and the byproducts of concentration like daily psychic powers or just seeing the internal phenomenon or the extreme bliss and uh, the happiness that can come with uh, with that. And then the, after having, you know, uh, explained that, then Puna asks him again, well, then does the, the Venerable One, uh, you know, practice uh, the Dhamma for uh, knowledge and vision of the way? And again, Sariputta says, not this, Venerable Sir. So knowledge and vision of the way, I'm going to explain that in a moment, <clears throat> refers to what are called the eight insight knowledges. And all along, through all these different stages, purification of uh, sila, purification of the mind, uh, purification of view, purification of overcoming doubts, purification by understanding what is the path and what is not the path. You're developing concentration and insights all along uh, and gaining insights into anicca, dukkha, and anatta until it's, it's all, you know, accumulating to a very powerful uh, balance of both concentration and mindfulness. And concentration and mindfulness are becoming very uh, balanced. And the mind becomes very powerful. And so this purification by the knowledge and vision of the way, basically it, it's, it leads out from the previous one of discerning what is the path and what is not the path. So what you discern as the path is the path of insight, which is knowledge and vision of the way, <coughs> of the, the way leading to uh, liberation, not the way leading to gaining psychic powers or just uh, to bliss and, uh, and, and so on. And so Sai Puto also, you know, knowledge and vision of the way, wow, wow, you know, it's like, yeah, but Puna says, no, we don't practice for that. So I put it again, scratching his head, wow. 
So, uh, <clears throat> so then, so I put asked him a further question. Uh, or sorry, put asked him if he practiced for knowledge and vision of the way. And Puna said, no, not this. So Sariputta then asks, well, does, then, does one follow the teachings of the Buddha for purification of knowledge and vision? And, and finally, uh, Venerable Puna uh, even tells him that knowledge and vision means the four stages of uh, you know, enlightenment. And so the, the Venerable Puna even replies, no, Venerable Sir. And the Sarit Puna is completely flabbergasted by now. You know. Although not really. He's, he's, he's getting off on answering these questions, uh, posing these questions. But, uh, <clears throat> so <coughs> but, you know, I can't understand. What? You're not even practicing for knowledge and vision of the way? Uh, and then he says, you know, I've asked the Venerable Puna about, you know, practicing for purification of sila, purification of the mind, purification of view, purification of overcoming doubt, purification of, you know, by knowledge and vision. And every time he says, no, this is not why we practice the Dhamma of the Buddha. And so Sariputta said, what do you practice for? And that's when Puna says, we practice for Nibbana without attachment. That's what we practice for, Nibbana without attachment. And Sai Puta says, Nibbana without attachment. And he says, and <clears throat> so he, that's when he gives this relay. He says, I don't understand. And this is when Venerable Puna then gives explains the relay of chariots. Well, let's say the king had to get a message over to the, the neighboring king. So he would use a relay of chariots. You know, maybe it was you know, 50, 60, 100 miles away. So the king using one set of horses would take that chariot, you know, until the horses got tired, change the chariot and the horses or get a new team of horses, and then use the new team to go to the next stage, and then the next stage, and then finally he would arrive at the, the destination. So therefore, you say, in the same way, purification of sila is for the purpose of, of arriving at purification of the mind. Uh, and because, according to the Dhamma, uh, if we're not following the precepts, and we're, you know, breaking the precepts and not living a disciplined life. And we have the hindrances that arise because of the not following sila. Then our mind will be set by, you know, guilt, worry, remorse, and fear, and greed, and so on. So we practice sila so that our mind will become free from guilt, worry, remorse, and fear. Or when you sit down and you're just entertaining sensual fantasies, or regurgitating anger and hatred towards somebody, you'll never gain concentration. So therefore, the practice of sila is for arriving at calmness of the mind, or purification of the mind. That means, so the hindrances will subside, and we attain that, those initial stages of tranquility, or calmness, where the mind isn't beset by uh, you know, restlessness and worry and, and uh, all these uh, agitations. And then purification of mind, again, just sitting in tranquility, uh, but without developing insight, is also of a limited, uh, uh, a limited nature. And, uh, you know, even animals can sit know, very calmly for a long period of time, uh, not being disturbed perhaps, uh, but that doesn't mean they have insights. So purification of view is the beginning of insight meditation. So we practice purification of mind in order to have that 
clear, concentrated consciousness to examine the five aggregates, to get that purification of view, to understand that our whole body-mind system is just uh, the process of nama rupa, mind cognizing materiality or the six senses and in the state of impermanence. There are just mind moments. Our whole mind is just made up of moments of hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, and thinking that are arising and uh, passing away. And in that, there's no self or I or me or owner or controller. That it's happening kind of just basically under the power of past conditioning uh, and so on. So that's called the purity of view. And that comes only when the mind has attained the state of concentration. Because it's like looking through a, a microscope. So a scientist looks through a microscope and gradually turns up the power of the microscope. But if somebody's coming in and jiggling and bumping the table and and uh, causing a ruckus, uh, it's difficult for the scientist to really clearly see what is happening through the lens of the microscope. So the tranquility provides that condition for the, the mind to you know, become sort of magnified, to understand, clearly see the five aggregates. Uh, <clears throat> so that's the first stage of insight is the purification purification of view. And so we have to reach that level before even going to deeper states of insight. As I said, there still could be lingering doubts. So even though people have, you know, an initial state of purification of view, it's still not perfect, and they could have doubts about the self. Well, you know, I think there's no self, but I, you know, I, I don't know. Or still maybe doubts about whether the Buddha was enlight fully enlightened. Or doubts about the Dhamma. Is this Dhamma really, you know, is all my time and effort ever going to prove any benefit or results? So these lingering doubts can still be there in the mind. The person That means a person has not attained stream entry yet. A person has not reached the level of the, uh, the Sotapanna. So that's why then the next level is the level of overcoming the doubts by contemplating Paticca Samuppada over and over in reverse order and forward and reversed orders until once you understood and seen the 12 links of dependent origination in the forward and reversed order, then you realize what a brilliant mind the Buddha had to be enlightened to think of something like that. To come up with something like that is just too profound for an ordinary person, you know, uh, uh, to come up with something like that. And, uh, and also seeing deeper into no self. And so one gets glimpses of the fading away of the ego and, and self-consciousness and so on. So therefore, gradually, the doubts are eliminated or overcome. So, but first, uh, you know, you have to attain that first level of uh, insight and then in order to reach, go on to the level of overcoming uh, the doubts. And then the level of discerning what is the path and what is not the path. Uh, again, I already kind of uh, mentioned that. But once you've overcome the doubts, then also uh, you understand that just concentration alone and the bliss or the, the lights or the other uh, powers and so on that might come through gaining uh, concentration and insight, this is not the real path. So uh, one uh, keeps on uh, on the path of insight, doesn't get distracted. Some people might talk to them, oh, but you've only attained the second jhana, man. Attain the third one, the fourth one. Attain the immaterial jhana as well, infinite space. Man, blow your mind, you know? So a person might think, oh, maybe I should do that. You know? So there's a still that, you know, that not having understood what is the real path and getting hung up on these, uh, these uh, even the immaterial jhanas. 
because it happens to a lot of people. Uh, and even at the time of the Buddha, it happened uh, until the Buddha clarified it. But, so anyway, uh, then you, you now then you you get truly on the path of insight. But again, don't get me wrong, whatever concentration that you might have gotten through practicing the jhanas is going to certainly be very valuable and help you develop the insight. But unfortunately, a lot of people get stuck, as I've already mentioned, on those other byproducts of the concentration. And uh, it's led them to, you know, some, you know, unfortunate uh, end of consequences, you know, such as going crazy even, or mm -hmm. uh, disrobing, or whatever. But, so, then purification, so now we're coming to purification of knowledge and vision of the way. And these are what are referred to as the eight insight knowledges, and uh, what is called the uh, conformity knowledge, change of lineage, and uh, the uh, um, conformity knowledge emergence and change of lineage is the actual attainment of the uh, uh, like the, the four stages of Sotapanna. And uh, this is very interesting because it's not normally talked about, but it's really the path of. Uh, vipassana or uh, the insight meditation, what are called the uh, insight knowledges, uh, which is the knowledge and vision of the way. It's the way of leading the mind out of the conditioned world. See, right now, the ordinary person, their mind is bound and caught in the, you know, the paticca samuppada and accumulating kama and just going around in circles. And for most people, <laughs> there's not much way out. And so this is actually the way out of the conditioned consciousness. And so the first of those insight knowledges is the insight into rise and fall. And so this means the insight into impermanence. But again, now mind you, having gone through all these previous stages. Now the mind is developed in concentration and insight, and it's primed uh, to be able to discern impermanence. You might think you understand impermanence at some level, but that level of understanding is probably fairly uh, ordinary or even mediocre. Uh, so the rise and the insight into rise and fall means you're training the mind on, on uh, focusing on each each moment of uh, hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, and thinking as they are uh, arising and vanishing at a very high speed. That's why in other Dhamma talks and in, in the, some of my meditation instructions, especially in longer retreats. I talk about this speeding up the rate of perception. So discerning rise and fall means you've reached a level where the mind is more open, it's not focused on any one particular object, and it's able to note many, many different sensory stimulations arising and vanishing at a very high rate of speed. Uh, and you deliberately try to increase that rate of perception. The reason why we can't see a lot of things coming and going because our mind is holding on to them, or the mind is dull. You know, it's just it's half asleep, or it's holding on and reacting to particular things, and so you don't notice everything else around it. It's like if you're looking into a keyhole. Okay, you might see what's right there, but you don't see what's around here too. But if you took your hand away from the eye, then all your periphery vision kicks in, right? And so maybe you don't see the details, but you could tell if a, something was, you know, climbing on the wall over there. You could hear a sound, you know, some distance behind you, or 
you know, this periphery vision, so to speak, or hearing, because it's not contracted around particular objects, so it attains a much more wider panorama, and it can notice many, many things arising and vanishing even simultaneously. Or in the space of even two or three seconds, you could notice a hundred or more things arising and vanishing. Body sensations, uh, you know, sounds. And so you deliberately tune into that. See, most people don't get to that level because the concentration hasn't reached that level. Otherwise, it becomes overwhelming. If you start noticing too many things are coming so fast, if the mind isn't calm, it'll, it'll get disturbed. And that's why, unfortunately, most people don't reach that level because they haven't reached that level of uh, tranquility. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, that's, so when you see how quickly things are rising and vanishing, I mean, crystal clearly, very vividly, you shift just like instantaneously. It almost shocks you how consciousness just, just like a camera lens, that quickly just, how it's, you know, you, you see it happening within your mind. Uh, and you see how clinging, when you start to cling to something, the suffering arises. But when you're in that flow of things just arising and vanishing, no suffering arises because Suffering arises because of the past and future identification, worry, fears, greed, based on these objects that you're remembering. But there's no time to remember when the mind is entering the, the rise and fall. There's no time to bring in the past and future connected with any particular stimulation. So therefore, all the disturbances that would arise because of the past and future identifications don't come. And so the mind remains you know, very open and balanced. You know. So when you see that very clearly, that's called the knowledge of rise and fall. And it's similar to a motion picture reel of film. You just see each... Uh, Rising and falling of consciousness is like a, an individual frame of a mo motion picture reel. You know? But when it's going quickly through a projector, we don't see the spaces in between the, the, the frames, right? And they're all run together. So it seems to be a continuous flowing scene that you see. But in the Perception of impermanence is like watching the movie on slow motion and you see each of the individual frames going like that. How many people have seen that in slow motion? That's, that's what happens in Vipassana meditation. <clears throat> and that's, that's cool. When you see it that clearly, that's the knowledge of rise and fall. And with that comes the knowledge of illusion. Because you see how the illusion is created through the attachment. Anyway, so that's the first insight knowledge. And then that, that keeps on building up speed and it's like you don't even see them arising anymore. The, th the second insight knowledge is called the knowledge of dissolution. And how many have seen a, a meteor showers at night or meteors at, you know, at night? How many, how many have kind of you know, noticed something you went like that and the thing had just vanished? You didn't even see it coming, it just vanished. Anybody ever see that? Yeah. Like you, you know, all you see is the trailer. That's what that's called the knowledge of dissolution. You don't even see them arising anymore. It's just like shooting stars, uh, and there's no time to think about uh, anything. So, emptiness basically is experienced because you know it's just vanishing moments. But the mind is still very calm. Again, this is happening internally within the consciousness. So it's something that's extremely subtle to see. And, uh, but, and so it's a very highly technical type of application. And again, when you start understanding what consciousness is made up of, and you see it like that, you also understand that Buddha was supremely enlightened because who could understand the mind like that? and giving us the techniques that we can actually come to that level ourselves. 
No one except the Buddha who taught the techniques like this, specific, this path of insight knowledge. But anyway, so <coughs> the, the, the second, the third insight knowledge, once you've seen the knowledge of arising and vanishing, then you, the knowledge of just vanishing, <coughs> then you see the world of the five aggregates is like a terror. It's like, you know, you see suffering at its deepest level and you see illusion, how we're caught in the wheel of illusion for nothing, you know, just through illusion itself, just through not knowing. And you see, you see, you get terrified of the, of how much suffering you're creating by yourself because of the clinging to that illusion and not seeing the truth. So it's similar to, so it's called the knowledge of terror. You see all the formations, the five aggregates, is a, like a terror. And so it has some kind of a, you know, in the beginning, some emotional thing. But there's a simile given. Let's say some strong men that drag a weak person toward a pit of glowing charcoal. So that person, when he gets close to the pit of charcoal, he'd be writhing and, and you know, trying to get free, right? Because he feels the heat of that pit of charcoal. But the strong men are keeping him down. And so that man is terrified because of getting burned, right? So when you get that type of insight, you get terrified of, of ignorance is what, it's ignorance that we're being terrified by. We've allowed our mind to get caught in the web of suffering through ignorance. We're not knowing the truth about consciousness. And so that's called the appearance of as terror. Again, it's a mental gimmick. It's a way of shocking the mind out of its, its uh, complacency, shocking the mind out of itself. And then the fourth insight knowledge is the knowledge of danger. And so this is an interesting analogy, okay? Once you've under, once that man, he was dragged to the pit of the charcoal, but then he got free. Now, but he, now he has firsthand knowledge that that charcoal is hot and, and it could burn him. But he doesn't go around being terrified of charcoal pits. He just stays clear of them. So he understands them as dangerous. But he, so he doesn't go near them. That's all. So it's the knowledge of danger that the five aggregates and ignorance of the five aggregates is a danger for getting trapped in the suffering and the web of karma due to the ignorance. Again, it's due to the ignorance. Uh, so the knowledge of danger means you stop, uh, you know, feeding and entertaining your attachment to the aggregates because you see the danger and the suffering, that's all. And it's not the aggregates or the suffering, it's the attachment is the, is the suffering. And so the danger is the danger of attachment, not in the object itself. Uh, so that's what's called knowledge of danger. And then uh, following the knowledge of danger is the, uh, the uh, dispassion. So you become dispassionate for the objects that cause you suffering. So you stop being infatuated by sights, sounds, smells, tastes, uh, and touches and even your uh, uh, thoughts because you see any kind of attachment or aversion leads to some kind of suffering. So you become dispassion. It means you don't hate them or nothing, you just lose the interest in them. They no longer entertain you so much. And you, you get more happiness by just sitting and meditating for a couple hours and if your friends come over and say, hey, there's a, you know, there's a big keg party, you know, <laughs> over here, <laughs> or whatever, you know, some movie stars, uh, you know, signing autographs somewhere or whatever, you know. 
you'd have this passion for that. It doesn't turn you on anymore. And you get just as much happiness just listening to the birds chirping in the trees or uh, just sitting alone, feeling your heartbeat. Just being in the present moment. Uh, so you become dispassionate for the attachment to external things, or even attachment to your own thoughts. You see all the rubbish going through your mind and all this you know, nonsense thoughts and judgments and opinions that we have, but you understand that all that is empty too. And so you, 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 know, you develop detachment for that. So detachment or dispassion is a similar word. So that knowledge of dispassion. And then the desire for deliverance. Ah, this is a good one. That means now you really, you, you, you're really seeing the path. And then that desire to become free from any last traces of attachment. That desire to really be totally free. Because even an a inkling, a small little smidgen of attachment you see is, you know, uh, like sitting in a mud puddle or something, you know. You, you wouldn't want to, you know, get dirty from that. So you want to become free from, from that. So that knowledge of the desire for deliverance arises in the mind, you know, to continue with the, uh, the practice. And then what is called reflection knowledge. Then you've come to that point. And then you review the whole dumb. You keep reviewing it in so many ways. Anicca, Dukkha, Anakta, the five aggregates, the six senses. And you keep reviewing it over the mind until it becomes, it goes down to the very quick, you know. It goes down to the, permeates all the levels of the unconscious mind. You keep reflecting on it. The Anicca, Dukkha, Anakta of, of all the Sankaras and so on, until you reach what is called equanimity. It's called sankara upekka. And having gone through all those stages, now the, the mind is fully imbued with the understanding of the Dhamma. And it's reached what is called the equanimity of formations, that nothing would None of the sensory impingements would, uh, you know, disturb your mind, really. And it's not because you're in a state of jhana and not feeling them, but it's because of that, that purity of the nervous system that uh, you reach that non-reactive uh, level of the nervous system. So, and then... If a person stays in that level of equanimity long enough, what is called the ninth stage of uh, what's called conformity, emergence, and change of lineage, which is the actual attainment of the paths of, of stream entry, uh, once returning, never returning, and arahant. Uh, and there's a little simile given for that. So the mind is no longer reacting to any of the sensory stimulations or even the thoughts in the mind. It will reach this total detachment. And so there's a, uh, what is called the conform, the mind conforms to the truth. And there's a simile of a bird, or it says a bat, but let's say a, a fruit eating a bat or a bird. It lands on a tree with five branches. And it thinks, lands on the tree thinking, I'm going to get some food, some fruit here. So it in investigates one branch, the material aggreg aggregate, and it finds there's no food there. So then it goes to the next branch of feeling and finds out there's no food there. Then it goes to the next branch of perception, there's no food there. The next branch of, of the mental formations, uh, sankaras, no food there goes to the next branch of consciousness. There's no food there. That means no food of the self or anything. And so it says, eh, this tree is useless. And so it sees a, a, a branch going up straight. And it gets on that branch and runs up 
up to the very top of the tree. That's called emergence. But the mind is now emerging from all the five aggregates, emerging from the conditioned reality. And it pokes his head up and sees the clear blue sky and jumps or starts flying and leaves that tree and alights on another tree. That's called change of lineage. And that tree is the tree of stream winning, or the that tree of, leaves the tree of the conditioned world and enters the realm of the Aryan, or the, the noble mind. So I know this is maybe hard for you to, some of you to understand, but, uh, but they're very beautiful little similes. Uh, and you can read more about them in some of the, in the texts that you have. But, uh, <clears throat> so that's how those, those three, the change of lineage actually, uh, or reaching the stage of uh, the stages of enlightenment. So anyway, just to finish the, the story, uh, the, the sutta. So that's the knowledge and vision of the way. And then uh, the purification by knowledge and vision is actually attaining these stages of uh, once uh, entering the stream, once returning, 